I'm on the program committee for all, Central Vermont OLLI, and I am glad to see so many of you when you could be out of this beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. spring day. Doing what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Shoveling mud. I don't to forget. <laughs> so anyhow, <clears throat> um, before we start the program, I want to tell you what's coming up. Um, next week, also right in this very room, we are going to have a talk about, it doesn't say Vermont sea seeding, but that's what it means. Um, plan B, it could be plan five, but I think it's plan B, the case for a second Vermont Republic. Yes. <laughs> so this is um, professor and publisher Robert C. Williams. He will present a 12 point program. This has nothing to do with drinking. For a second Vermont <laughs> Republic, a plan for interdependence. So that is here, right, um, right in the, at the Aldrich. And I might as well go on to the next week, but I know you can't remember past that. <laughs> I can't even remember until next week. So the next, on March 14th, also right here, is a program on the American elm tree given by conservationist Gus Goodwin, who works for the Nature Conservancy. Still and three days after that is Bob's birthday. Bob's birthday. We should really let her come to this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there are two empty, two empty seats down here if anybody wants to use them. Are there any other empty seats? Yeah. You've got one next to you, Priscilla? Oh, oh there's two over there, but you have to sit on various people's lounges. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You'll be called on <laughs> Okay. Enough about me. So, today we are very lucky to have Susan Abbott with us. Susan Abbott uh, has a BFA and MFA in painting from the Maryland Institute College of Art, and she has worked as a professional artist since that time. She's exhibited in galleries and museums around the country. Her paintings are represented in numerous corporate and individual collections and have been featured in many publications and even on the Oprah Winfrey Show. <laughs> Susan is a popular teacher of art workshops both in the U.S. and abroad. So I give you Susan Abbott. Thank you. <clears throat> um, maybe we can just dim these lights because this, this talk is all about the art I'm showing. So originally we were going to call this. To oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A propitious beginning. So is that good? Everybody yeah. hear me? Okay. Okay. So originally we, I was going to call this how artists see, and then I thought I'm a little averse to the word artist. It's a very highfalutin term that has a lot of um, kind of baggage loaded into it. So I really want to talk about how people in my trade painting see. And um, what I want to do is talk about the very specialized language that a visual art uses. And I know that there are people here who paint, because some of you have taken a class or two with me. And, um, and, and so some of this will be familiar to those that are actually also artists here, or painters here. Others, um, it might be a bit of a revelation. And when I'm done, you might feel like some of my students do who first start painting um, and ask me, oh, come on. The painters aren't really thinking about all that stuff, are they? To which I'll answer, yes, they are, to differing degrees in a given painting. So part of, um, I think, the mythology that surrounds painters um, is, well, there's a lot of mythology. That would be great for a whole other lecture. But one of the myths, I think, is that we're just born talented, you know, and um, sort of like we spring out of Zeus's forehead and we know how to do all this stuff. And those civilians, as my husband, who's not a painter, calls non-painters, um, just don't have it and they don't know. And, and you know, there's a little truth in, in, in those, but uh, also a lot of falseness to both of those ideas. So if you look up at the slide here, and actually I didn't have to show this because we're surrounded by great kids art in this room. Um, but it, there is truth that we do start out as natural painters. Um, if a kid is given a piece of paper and paint and pencils, they will do the right thing with, with that paper and paint. And what they, what they do is, 
they use the whole piece of paper. So because in a child's mind, because of the imaginations we have until it's kind of crushed out of us later on in life, we feel as though when we're little, or like if you watch your grandkids paint, that that piece of paper is a world. It's, it's magic, you know? So if they're gonna put something in the upper left-hand corner, they're gonna put something in the lower right-hand corner. And that's what, the, in the language of painting, we call the format. In other words, it's the page, it's the canvas. And what happens as we get a little older, say about eight, seven, eight, nine, if we keep drawing, which kids will do if they're given the equipment to do it usually, is that we start to get interested in stuff. It usually divides into ponies or dancers for girls. <laughs> Um, and I would have to say having raised two boys, soldiers or, um, yeah, race cars or, you know, and I don't mean to make, um, uh, you know, unfair uh, generalizations about that. But, you know, I think ponies are big and I'm sure there are a lot of little boys that draw ponies. But what happens is that we get interested in what it is cataloging the world. and and we forget about the format. So if you look at this drawing, like there's nothing going on at the edges. And that's a natural kind of progression we go through. But then what we have to do when we lose not only the magic of the page, which we, when we're, we're back after a long training, we, we, we have it again, is we, we have to relearn, like in this Franz Klein painting, we have to relearn that kind of animating of the whole page, like it's a world that we create. Another thing that kids have is tremendous gesture and action and a lack of inhibition. When people say, I can't draw a straight line, and I'll bet, how many of you feel that way? I can't draw a straight line. You know, it's not that damn easy to draw a straight line. You know, and it's actually, if I gave you a piece of paper and I said, you put the pencil at the bottom and push it up to the top, there's a kind of inhibition that we can feel about making a mark on a page. Little kids don't have that. Here's a Joan Mitchell drawing. And, you know, she, she got that back after, after self-consciously training to be a painter. Here's another child's drawing. Here's a de Kooning painting. You know, so it's something, this kind of ability to have an uninhibited gesture is part of our language that we, we train for, that comes back to us over time. So artists do train. I mean, that's another kind of myth is that it's easy to be a self-educated artist. Actually, very few artists are self-taught if you look at those who end up making a profession or whose work is in galleries and museums. We tend to start in grade school. We're the class artists oftentimes. We go on in high school. We're the misfits hanging out in the art room. Then we often specialize at college and go to, it's basically a trade school of four years. And then many of us go on to grad school. So we've got about as many years as a lawyer does you know, in, into our field. And part of the way we learn is by past art. So the language of art is not sequential. It goes back, artists today are learning from cave paintings. So here, you know, copying is one way. Here's a you and you glow wonderful painter copying of Poussin. Here's a Dutch uh, still life that Matisse copied. Matisse actually made a living copying in the Louvre, doing very realistic copies of paintings. So that's, you know, that learning this language takes years, and it's something we learn from dead artists, basically. And speaking of art school, Matisse was in art school so long doing studies like this, they finally kicked him out and said, go try to figure out how you're gonna make a living at this. So another thing that's interesting about painter's language is why do painters paint the way they paint? You know, paint is basically, everybody's using the same kind of paint. Why do some works look so different between Van Gogh and Rembrandt, or Matisse and Wyeth? Well, a lot of it is what the artists are taking in for, you could say inspiration, you could say guidance, you could just say what, you know, what they're passionate about. For Matisse, it was these icons in a, different, in a certain period of time. <sighs> African masks were very influential for Matisse and Picasso and other painters. So by these different cultural influences also, also, also changed their language. 
I'm only going to be talking about Western art, but you know, that's my, my frame of reference. But some of what I'm saying does hold true for other art cultures. Some of it is very specific to the way we as Westerners see, which is different in terms of what our painting looks like than from the way other cultures see. So if you look at this long career of Matisse, you can see he changed his language different ways. And sometimes he was emphasizing a round form, sometimes he's emphasizing a flat form. I'm going to talk about all that kind of switching, how we see, you know, based on what it is we want. Another thing in a painter's work that's interesting to look at, and maybe you're not aware of, is how much experimenting a professional artist does. I get the feeling, like from my students, that they think, oh, there's going to reach a point, and I'm going to know just what I'm doing, and I'm going to go to my studio, and every painting's going to be great, and there's not going to be any, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, and that's not true. And so if you look at Matisse, you can see, you know, all through his life, him going back to these same themes and trying them different kinds of ways over and over again. So that's part of the language. It's, it's also an ex experimental kind of a language. Some of the way a painter's work looks has to do with where they are in their life. When I had small children, I switched to watercolor because I could put it up and, and, and take it you know, down. It was, it was very easy to keep having working in small increments of time. Now I'm back to oils because I can concentrate for six or seven hours at a time. Matisse, at the end of his life, was paralyzed. And so he did these cutouts that built on everything he had done before. So an interesting thing to look at is how you go from, for a, a, a realist painter, let's say, who's getting their cues from nature, how you go from a kind of chaotic scene like this, that actually nature's very chaotic when you go out and you know, trying to figure out what to paint. And how do you go through those steps to flatten it out? Because that's part of that's the language of painting is to take the three-dimensional world, flatten it out, and reorganize it, and add color. So I want to kind of walk you through some of those steps of the different vocabularies that we learn when we learn to be visual artists. So if we take away color now and just look at line, okay? So this is a contour line. How many of you know have heard of contour lines before? Yeah, contour line's a very magical thing. It's a straight line that's not an outline. It's got three-dimensionality to it. How do you learn to do that? That's not something little kids naturally do. That's a very learned way of seeing. Well, part of it is doing exercises. For a lot of these kinds of vocabularies, we, we practice them separately. And then later, after we're more adept, we start putting them together. So here you can see, here's a continuous contour line. This is an exercise starting from the finish to the end. Here's Matisse doing a contour drawing, two feet from a nude model. People who are civilians look at this and go, ooh la la, but actually, when you're a visual artist, the nude model, it's like you're in med school. I mean, for me anyway. <laughs> I can't speak for Picasso on that necessarily, but you know, by and large, it's like it's clinical. You know, it's like something we work with. And you can see here, he's really staring at her and not at his paper. And that's contour drawing. That's how you learn this vocabulary, is that you look at what you're drawing and you don't look at your paper very much. It's counterintuitive, but what it builds is a very strong sense of the object as a, as a sculptural, three-dimensional thing and a hand-eye coordination. So your pencil sort of traces around that shape. Um, and, and your eye and your hand and the shape are all one. And that sounds sort of like hocus pocus, but again, it's actually a skill that, that we develop. This is a cross contour drawing. That's another kind of movement out of outline, contour, and into shading and three dimensionality. And this is something computers now do very well, you know, where they, they can make uh, three dimensional shapes out of contour lines. But we visual artists do this with our hand and eye, and sometimes, like in this case, we take um, shapes that are already striped, that are actual contours. Here's a beautiful drawing by Watteau where he's posed the model in a stripe. And you can see that by following the stripe, you follow her form. So the stripe moves as her form moves, and that, again, that's something we get better at, that we can kind of move with those shapes and describe a form by describing contour. 
here's a Rembrandt. Sometimes there are no actual lines, and that's where we have to intuit the shape. So as we learn to draw better, it, we become almost like sculptors. We become very good at the sense that we're touching a form with our eyes. And again, it's not metaphysical. It's like a very, um, it's a skill you develop that any of you can develop over time. Drawing is a very teachable skill, very learnable. So when you find somebody who's really, really a great draftsman like Rembrandt, you see them putting these different types of seeing together into a beautiful drawing like this. And if you go down this model's back, imagine you could do this with just one line that wouldn't have any sense of dimension. But if you go down her back, you can see he's got on the shoulder one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten lines going down her back, all of which are different in weight. So that he's not only showing you what's closer to the top, he's showing you what's underneath, all through line weight. Okay, so that's somebody who's really, really sensitive with using cross contour line and contour line. Also in that Rembrandt drawing was a sense of gesture. Did you notice it looked almost like a Japanese calligraph in a way, the way he used his brush? So gesture is another one of those horses we're driving when we've got that whole chariot of of, of drawing going. And what gesture means is sort of what it sounds. It's like if you look at the bow, the bow on the top left is drawn with contour. The bow on the bottom right is drawn with gesture. You see how it's like another lens that we've got on? So we're not, on the bottom right, we're not doing a line description of exactly where the edge meets space. We're showing what that bow, in a sense, feels like as it's moving through, through, this, through the space. So you can recognize a gesture drawing when you see it. Here's one where the model's taken three poses. And gesture drawings, when you practice them in school, are done really, really quickly. And then if you've got somebody like Rembrandt, who's really good at them, they can go out on the street and draw fast. And again, we're not trying to get detail with gesture. We're just trying to show the whole picture of how a form is moving. Okay, so it's a different kind of vocabulary. It's like a different lens we're putting on the camera. Rodin is another wonderful gesture drawing. He would have a, a, um, a model just move around his studio and work on big sheets of newsprint. And every time she changed a pose, it was like a 30 second pose, he would do a drawing. So gesture drawings are typically 20 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe a minute. <coughs> And you usually, in art school, you start a life class with 20 minutes of gesture. So, you know, it's a, it's, and it's a, great, it's a great thing to do in your sketchbook. So how that translates to painting can be, in this case of an abstract expressionist painter, it's all about gesture. Um, again, having that movement of the arm become the mark. <clears throat> gesture can, but, but also gesture works into all kinds of painting. It works into landscape. It works into oil painting. And it's one thing that creates a more interesting kind of surface for, for a painting, more engaging. Gesture isn't just the line quality, though, or the way the artist is looking at a shape and space. It's also within paintings to create movement. So part of our language is how do we compose? How do we create both stability and balance in a painting? but also create movement. So I think about this as being composition and painting is like composition in anything. It's like your life. It's like you don't want so much stability, you're bored stiff, but if you've got too much movement in your life, well, you know, it's like your bills aren't being paid and you've been evicted and <laughs> you know, you've run off with the secretary or whatever. So you're looking for something in between, you know, and that's sort of where painters too are, are in there in that language of composition, they're trying to create enough movement that you get from, say in this case, Christ's figure to the apostle's figure. Um, and the way they're doing that is by actual hand gestures. So these are all things that we're not looking at a painting aware of, but the painter is. And that's why we're sucked into the painting and engaged with it. Very complex paintings like this Poussin, which used to be back when history painting ruled, when painters were supposed to be able to tell stories with their work more than they are now. 
there was the need to orchestrate a lot of figures in space. And gesture became really important for that. Here's an analysis of that through Photoshop. And you can see all the different arm gestures and figures going one way, figures going another. Again, all orchestrated by Poussin in order to create these, these, all these kind of intersecting gestures through the painting. Okay, now let's put gesture aside. And when we, when we learn this language, we have to compartmentalize too. So we can't be thinking about gesture if we're thinking about this next thing, and that's negative space. It's a whole different lens we're putting on our camera. How many of you know what negative space? Anybody ever heard that? Okay, so it's a very interesting concept. It's a completely unwestern idea. We're not interested in the empty stuff in between the real thing. That's, that's an Eastern idea. You know, if you think about an Eastern garden, it's all about those empty spaces between the rocks. Our gardens are about the plants, right? But negative space is a huge, huge tool. It's essential for painting and drawing and seeing accurately. Our big job when we paint, when we're painting realistically especially, is to take three-dimensional reality and flatten it out. And then when you look at it, it looks three-dimensional again. So we got to go through all these kinds of tricks or, or, or vocabularies in order to get there. So negative space, if I have a student and they're not seeing negative space yet, I know they're going to be struggling with their drawing. And what does it mean? It means that you're flattening everything out to the extent that what you're interested in is the stuff in between the shapes. So that in this case, like the gaps in the chair and the background are as important as the furniture is. It's an interesting thing, but the chair and the table and the umbrella, they share an edge with the wall, right? It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Does that make sense? So if I draw that nameless flat shape, the big jigsaw space on the left-hand upper side, it's much easier to draw that than to draw the chair and the umbrella. It's not cheating. That's, <laughs> that's what makes us able to draw complicated things. Does that make sense? So if I flatten it out and turn it all into a jigsaw puzzle, then I can deal with the negative shape. So if you squint at that, and squinting is a great tool for painting, if you squint at it and try to make the blue the real thing and not the vase and the flowers and the scarf, you can see it'd be much easier to deal with that blue shape than trying to figure all those flowers out. You really, that really it comes home when you're dealing, say, with complicated New England gable roofs. I could never figure out perspective-wise what's going on with that, but I can do a painting and turn that sky into a puzzle piece, and I can paint the sky, and I'm painting the roof at the same time without having to figure out the perspective. Okay, so you can see what a huge tool negative space would be. In design, uh, say in the Swissler painting, that's another place where negative space comes in, you know, where He's creating this design with uh, looking at these big negatives. And here's a John Singer Sargent watercolor. He's got, this watercolor is not finished, but see how he's kind of drawing the figure by drawing the landscape first. Does that make sense? Because that figure is complex. You know, so he's, he's really putting more time into the negatives here than into the very simple shape, positive shape of the, of the figure. So, We've got these different tools that help us with shapes and edge. And now we've got to turn it all into a painting somehow. And we've got to go back to that idea that we've got this piece of canvas or piece of paper, it's a watercolor or pastel, and it doesn't have limitless edges. I mean, that's our format, you know. And so what are we going to do if we're painting outside like this? And we've got to figure out what we're going to paint. And this is something that painters are always thinking about. It's essential. It's like one of the main points is what's going to fit on the canvas and what am I going to leave out? And here you can see Monet figuring that out. And this is a gesture drawing. See how sketchy it is? And here's one of the many paintings he did of the Garcin Lazare. So he's thinking right from the get-go about what goes in and what stays out. Now, if you take a subject, this is a place I, I, I go into the Bahamas to teach every winter, and here's a place I've painted before. Before you start to think about what painters are doing, you have the idea that they just kind of go and sit down in front of something and copy it. Well, you've got to decide what it is you're interested in. 
here's a lot of stuff. Here's a painting that's about the shadows more of that subject. Here's a painting of the same subject that was more about the sky. Here's a painting of the same subject that's more about the land, right? So it's like, again, with the camera, I'm shifting my point of interest depending on what I want to get into the composition. So there's a tremendous amount of editing that goes into speaking this language. In this case, you can see that it's like if you're outside painting, thinking about where's my viewfinder going to be? What am I going to paint? Oftentimes, people, especially when they're first learning to paint outside, they take on way too much. It's like we just want, oh yeah, I want to go all the way from that house to that apartment building over there and put the entire parking lot in between. It's like, you know, they, they're not thinking so much about what am I really interested in here? Maybe it's something like this that has a kind of compositional idea to it rather than the whole thing. And so what we learn to do is not to think about subject. We think about composition. If you go to an amateur painting show, you're going to see many, many paintings of red barns in Vermont. If you go to Maine, there are going to be a lot of seagulls. You know? <laughs> Um, every part of the country has got its tropes that a lot of people will paint. And they're painting subject, they're not painting composition, right? So if you're painting composition, you're thinking more about what you're going to leave in and what you're going to, what you're going to take out based on creating that composition that's got both balance and movement and all this other stuff I'm talking about. Now, let's think about value. Okay, how many of you have thought about value in painting at all? Anybody? Okay, now value doesn't mean the worth in, when, as a painting term. It means dark and light. So it's, if you think of it like a musical scale, there, here on this sketch I've done, I've got five notes. See on the right, I've got five values going from white to black with a middle gray in between and then a middle light and a middle dark. That's called a value scale. In photography, it can be 10 values. Or it could be one or two. Here's Winslow Homer using a value scale to do a uh, ink painting. So value is, is absolutely essential for painting. Value comes before color. What, it's like black and white photography comes before color photography. Painters get so that they see their compositions in terms of value oftentimes before they see them in terms of color. And they get so they can organize really complicated things with darks and lights. And that's where the design comes from. It's also where a sense of space comes from. So right from the, when landscape became its own subject in the 16, 15, late 1500s, 1600s, painters started, started to set up this kind of diorama space with value where there'd be dark values in the front and then light values in the back. And that's how nature is. The lighter values are, are farther away because of all the atmosphere in between us and that stuff back there. So even up with the Impressionists, you can see that Monet here, he's much more interested in color, but he's organizing by value with the trees on the right darker and the, that island in the back is, is a mid-value and the sky is lighter. Value sets up um, landscape space. It also creates design. If a painter doesn't have strong underlying values, even if the painting is technicolor, there's not going to be a design there. And here's a, here's a painting by Wolf Kahn, whose work you may know that I've taken the color out of in Photoshop. And here it is with color. So the color adds a lot, but the underlying bones of the painting is in the, the values. Here's a Vermeer that I've desaturated in Photoshop. And you can see he's got these big movements of dark, middle, and light value that are underlying that painting we all know so well. So when we're out in nature, we're not only imposing a kind of grid on what we're seeing that, that takes all this chaos out there and, and focuses right down to a small, composition that's got balance and movement, but we're also imposing or, or, or we're pulling out from what we're seeing values. 
here's just two values. The Japanese have a term for this, notan, N-O-T-A-N, which means a design of just two values where all the darks link together. And you can see it's satisfying, you know, like there's a structure there. And then the painter will take that same design and break it down into a middle value, a couple middle values to kind of flush it out. <clears throat> so if we go from, say, painting, standing in this alley painting, like I, I was doing, we see it in full color, but in our mind we desaturate it into value and into uh, shapes, and then it goes back into color again when we paint it. Now, another aspect of this language is a sense of how one thing relates to another in your painting and in nature, in life. Here we see Leonardo analyzing the human face with a series of lines. See how he's saying, okay, what's underneath the iris? Okay, the corner of the mouth. What's, underneath, what's over the nostrils? Okay, the insides of the eyes. Everybody's got the same basic head proportions and kind of webbing. So if you think of webbing, is it is, means it's this underlying structure in nature that you don't see unless you look for it. And it makes the world a pretty interesting place to see that anytime you sit down and look at something and you start to overlay in your mind's eye relationships of where things lie in relationship to each other, there's a kind of order that starts to emerge that we're trained as painters to see. Some artists use webbing as part of the way they paint. This is a U and U glow, a British artist. And if you see in between the pairs, you see that line? So he was somebody who did measurements for everything in a painting. Um, to, he came out of a time when abstract painting had become kind of the eminent. And he wanted to return to perceptual painting, where he was really observing while he painted. And so he started to do these very obvious kind of grid and web lines so that he was drawing that straight line and then holding his pencil or brush up to the pairs and, and really seeing where do they lay along that central line. And all those little marks in the pairs, he's doing as notations on where one thing is in relationship to another. Who knew huh? <laughs> that that kind of looking is going on underneath that painting? So, I mean, Cezanne is somebody that it's very easy to see that he's doing something that's got a whole, con a whole lot of structure underneath it, you know. And here's somebody who's analyzing the Cezanne painting, how all these different shapes are lining up and um, how they are in relation to each other. Here's another Cezanne bathers. So, I, I mean, I, I guess I'd say one way I would define painting is about, it's, it's, it's about the relationship of shapes and colors on a flat surface. You know, that it's all about relationship. How one shape, how one color relates to another and relates to the edge. Now, how many of you have noticed on a drawing, this is a Degas drawing, but on an old master drawing, this <coughs> grid that's lying under, yeah. Ever see that grid that's like on this Degas drawing? Look, look for it if you're in a museum or looking through a book of drawings. What the grid is done after the artist does the drawing in order to blow it up in size onto the canvas. So you see it a lot in um, paintings or drawings from like the 14, 15, 1600s, especially when um, frescoes were being used, where the, the, the master would do the drawing that required the skill and the assistant would grid it and then uh, let's say on this Degas drawing every grid is a half inch or let's say an inch and then on the painting he would do a foot grid and then he could blow it up just using negative space and looking very abstractly he didn't have to rethink the work of how do you draw that arm and how do you draw that that head does that make sense so he's looking very abstractly and at just at line angle and negative shape to, to blow the drawing up. Now another thing to think about in painting is diagonal lines. Diagonals are how we 
do perspective. Perspective, again, means taking how three-dimensional objects vanish away from us in space and turning that into flat. Nine times out of ten, I'm going to say ten times out of ten, if I take somebody who's never drawn before and I put them in front of this road and I say draw the road, they're going to have the bottom of the road come off the bottom of the page. In other words, they're not going to see how extreme the angles of the road are going back. The world is a much weirder looking place than we think it is. Okay, so in our left-brained way, thinking about roads, we never really see that these angles are very, very acute, and they're actually going off the sides of the page, not the bottom of the page, right? So as we're trained to speak this language, we learn to not trust our brain. We learn to rely on our eyes, right? And what that shows us is that the road is doing something that doesn't make any logical sense. It's disappearing into a dot, and then it's getting really, really big when it hits the bottom of the page. We learn not to second guess that and just go with it. You know? So if it's who you're going to believe, me or your lying eyes, we believe our eyes. <laughs> <laughs> now, in terms of buildings and perspective, we're not architects. Okay? What we learn to do is site perspective. If I had to explain to you why in this sketch I did in, um, in Paris, why all these buildings are going back like that, I really would have a hard time explaining it to you. But I can see it because, for one thing, I'm using the negative space of the sky. And I also have general ideas about how diagonals work as they go back and how they switch direction from the bottom to eye level when they become level. And then above eye level, they start to go the opposite way for diagonals. So that's another lecture. But <laughs> that's something that's um, an important part of diagonals in painting, right? So it's perspective. But that's not the whole story of diagonals in painting. They're also used to create movement, like I talked about before, um, that need to keep the eye going around the page, around the canvas. Here's a diagonal. Anybody see a diagonal in this painting? Yeah, where is it? The knife, okay. This is a Chardin painting, a brilliant, wonderful still life painter from the 1700s in, in Paris. And it's a really shallow space he's working on. He's just working on a ledge by a window. And, he, and, but, and yet there's a lot of thrust in that space. And that's that diagonal. So when you look at still life, that's an interesting thing to see is how does the artist create some movement back into that still life? Here's another, um, this is Mark Adams. Uh, this is a watercolor, a great big watercolor. Now, those of you that knew, know, do watercolor know that this is a technically extremely difficult watercolor. And he got so sick of people asking him, how are you doing that in watercolor? He switched to acrylic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here you can see just that little bit of tilt, how that creates so much dynamism, right, in that shallow space, in that open book. That's all deliberate. You know, he, he fooled around with that book a lot till he got that diagonal, I'm guessing, um, that worked with the rest of that, that kind of grid sort of layout. Here's a, um, a British painter who's learned a lot from Chardin, I think. And you know, here you can see how the, the shadows are diagonals that are creating thrust in the space. So it's not only in landscape and figure painting and still life, it's not only the stuff, it's also shadows that can work for you. Here's a diagonal being created, moving us back into space by the axis of the figure. So when Wyeth was laying this out, he thought a lot about where those two hands were going to be. He just didn't tell Christina, go plop down in the field. I mean, he did a whole lot of drawings trying to figure out what would give the best kind of webbing line, the best access that would move us right back in space like a laser to, to the house. And when you have these complex Baroque paintings like this Caravaggio, which again, they're like, they're like symphonies, it, it, you know, as opposed to like a, like a solo cello piece or something. Like these are like these complicated movements. Diagonals become extremely important as ways to, to create bridges between the figures. Now, in painting, there are a, many, many analogies with music. How many of you are musicians or play any music in here? Okay. So I find I'm not a musician, but I 
find that when I talk about painting, I'm often using musical terms, and, and because musical terms are embedded in visual art, they share a lot of characteristics in terms of how the language we speak. So this is a nocturne by Whistler. Whistler called it a nocturne. And why is it a nocturne? Well, it's a night painting, but it's also a very um, kind of peaceful composition. It's a restful composition. Here's another Richard Diebenkorn painting that's similar to that nocturne. It's got a lot of space in it, a lot of peace. If you think about it in a musical composition, it would be the, that's the adagio, right? That's got kind of a, a different rhythm than the, um, than the faster parts of the string quartet. Here's another painting that fits right in with being a quieter kind of a movement. But some painting is very discordant. It deliberately discordant, so it's jarring. It has to do with value, it has to do with color, the intensity of the color, it has to do with the smallness of the shape, it has to do with not having big unified movements. Also in painting is rhythm. So this is a um, John Sell Cotman, a wonderful British landscape painter from the 1700s. And it looks very modern to us because it's kind of a painting about nothing. It's something we'd see out in the field here. But it's beautifully orchestrated. And part of what he's doing are these rhythms. You see that? So a rhythm would be the same kind of shape repeated at regular intervals. Here you see it in this Maurice Prendergast with these flags marching back. So a painter doesn't always use rhythm in a painting, but they might find, hey, this is a place where rhythm would work, or this is a subject that's about a rhythm. Here's a Fairfield Porter painting with a very distinct, almost like a little drum punctuation, isn't it, going across the, the field there, those trees. Also in painting, you see parts of the composition that are quiet and parts of the composition that are active, right? So here, this John Singer Sargent, it's got so much going on in the bottom half. The top half is a place we can go to and take a breather, all right? Again, it's, that's a deliberate thing painters do, is to set up active areas and quiet areas in a painting. Now, one thing you gotta remember is that painting is made out of paint. You know, it's like, it's very physical. Like, it's, this is Winslow Homer's paint box. What a mess, you know? It's a little paint box, it's all, you know, like I wanna just get in there and clean, clean that thing up. But what Homer had was, and here's Homer, a Homer painting, beautiful, clean color, is he had a very strong knowledge of color theory, of how to use his color. So I want to segue out of the drawing and the value and compositional aspects we've talked about, and now talk about color. So color starts with the color wheel for painters. Paint is just kind of a jumble on your, in your paint box. I mean, it doesn't have any order to it. And what the color wheel does is it, put paint, it puts paint in an order that we can use to create different, very clear relationships between the colors. It can be a color wheel of any colors. Here's a color wheel of duller colors, kind of earth colors. And you can see you've got the reddish color, the bluish color, and the yellowish color, and they mix to secondary colors. They mix, we know purple in there because the triad is, is very neutralized but you're mixing them together to get the intermediate colors. And a palette like that, that's this palette in this little watercolor, it can give you a lot of variety in the color, right? But it's limited, it's limited. So you can have paintings and color wheels that are really based on only two colors, but if they're the right two colors, you can get a tremendous amount of movement and variety and space in the painting. Why is that? Well, that's because of temperature, okay? So we talked about value. Color is actually the third thing that a painter will think of oftentimes. They'll start with value in the design, then they'll think about this, temperature. What's warm, what's cool? Then they'll plug color into that. So these, this, these paintings I'm showing you are British paintings that were done with just burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, just a brown and a blue. And here's another more modern painting. And you, it's, I mean, you'd probably be surprised that it's only those two colors, right? But what they have is the, the, the brown has warmth in it and the blue has coolness. So the bold brown has some yellow and the cools have blue. And that creates, the blues tend to be a little more recessive. The, the warms, they, they go back in space more, the warms come forward. 
And it also just creates a kind of rhythm again, a back and forth rhythm. Here's a, the first coat. Sometimes painters will start, this is an oil painting where I've started with just a brown and a blue to get my drawing and my values established, and then it's going to go into full color. So that's one approach to working on a larger oil painting. <clears throat> so if you, if we go back and think for a second about composition, one of the ways that composition, why we think about it is, is or even care about it, is it creates psycho a psychological impact in the painting. So if you look at this, you think about Hopper. He's often given the rap, well, it's, he's all about human isolation, and he kind of is, you know. And one reason that we get this strong emotional impact from Hopper is how he tends to set things back away from you. So you have to work to get to the subject. You know, you know, you know, you gotta go over those rocks in that field to get to that house. And again, that's a very deliberate part of Hopper's vocabulary. You see him using it over and over again. You also see with some painters this use of a, of a limited palette, you know, to create a kind of unifying mood in the painting. Here's a sergeant. This painting has six little kids cam camouflaged in it. I don't know if you can see them down there. That's Sargent. Here's another painter from Quebec using just that limited palette. Here's a painting that's based more on the warm and a painting that's based more on the cool. So this is something to look for when you're out looking at paintings. Ask yourself, what color am I seeing in this painting? Because you'll be surprised very often the painter is working with only three, four colors, but they're doing it very, very skillfully. Here's a Mirandi. Um, who worked his whole life moving the same little still life objects around his studio, um, you know, doing this fantastically beautiful body of work about them. So when we go to art school, here's something I had my students do, is to take a, Mara uh, just I gave them paint, um, paint samples and had them analyze a Mirandi painting and then do a kind of copy of one and just try to hone. So what we're doing is we're trying to hone our eye for subtle differences in color not just the bright colors, but the subtle colors. Now those are two Monets and you can see the warm and cool, the difference that you get in mood. That's another use of warm and cool. Warm colors are much more exciting, they're in your face more, cool colors are more relaxing. Um, like they don't paint bordellos light green and they don't paint hospital rooms bright red, right? For a reason. Those of you that have been in a bordello lately would know that, right? <laughs> So here's the same, um, the same scene done in two different colors with two very di two different color palettes, one warm and one cool. Sometimes painters, you can see that a painting, painters tend towards warmer colors or sometimes cooler colors in their work. And again, there's a lot of mood um, that comes through those color choices. So on the color wheel, all the colors on the left are warm because they all have some yellow and all the colors on the right are cool because they all have some blue. Complementary color is another um, color theory that's used. It's completely always in a painter's toolkit and it's, it's, it's very important for a couple of different things. One is creating contrast. You get the most contrast between complements and they're opposite on the color wheel. So yellow and purple. There's a, you really see the yellow more because of the purple. So this goes back to the idea of relationships being so important so that we the purple makes the yellow look more yellow and vice versa. So you'll see painters who'll build a whole color composition around a complementary relationship. Like this painting, I knew I wanted a lot of purple because of that yellow sign. Or I pushed the shadows much more purple than I might have in another painting because of that chartreuse yellow grass. Here's a Joan Mitchell. We see the yellow, we see that background as being more yellow because of the purple. So we have a hardwired relationship with complementary color and a skillful painter will make these yellows look, the sun look more like it's in on that grass. We'll feel the light more because they can push those shadows a little more purple so that we read that yellow more intensely. Same with green and red. You see, now that you can look for it, start to see how often painters will base compositions, here's orange and blue, on complementary relationships. Another last thing about complements, they create the most contrast. They, they also, this is the second thing, they talk to each other. 
because we're kind of, if you ever look at a green red light and close your eyes and see green, am I the only weird child that did that? Yeah. Um, we, like this pair, Faison put the blue plate down there so that we would, it would talk to those orange peaches. Lastly, complements, when you mix them together, go neutral. You take a bright red and a bright green like at the top and you keep mixing the two together and this goes any medium you're working with, watercolor, oil, and you end up with basically gray. So that's a, that's a very helpful thing for creating what we call chromatic neutrals. Those are neutrals, grays, blacks, browns, that are just packed with, with color. And sometimes also a skillful painter can tone a painting down and, and do these kinds of mixes that we, like it, we could look at this Mirandi and think it's bright color, but it's not. You can see if you superimpose a white, black, and ochre on top, those are very muted colors. So that's another good thing to look for is, is like the color you're looking at. Is it, is it intense and vivid? Oftentimes it's more muted. Now painters have that are working real, with realism have the issue of what do you do with those nameless things like concrete, walls, you know, floors. There's no like concrete paint. You gotta mix it yourself. <coughs> and that's where it's fascinating. There's the subjectivity that comes in. In this painting, I pushed it more violet because I love color and I like making this whole kind of vibrant color composition, but that isn't the only solution. Here's a George Bellows. So these are just some examples of that nameless stuff that a skilled painter can push into these beautiful nameless kinds of colors. Also, you'll notice that a lot of these subjects are not telling big stories and they're not heroic. Like they're looking at very ordinary stuff and making beautiful paintings out of them. So when we look about, we look at um, the relativity of color, like we saw the relativity of other things. Those three bottom colors are all the same colors, the squares and the middle. You see how different they look, but depending on what's around them. I don't know if you know Joseph Albers' work, but he, his whole life was painting these squares to show you how color changed so much based on what it was next to. So if we go back again to the idea of a limited palette, part of what a painter learns is to, to do a lot with not a lot, like how to make the most of limited means can be a really good exercise. So just taking red, yellow, and blue, that's a Jasper Johns painting, and working with those three colors. Red, yellow, and blue are what we call a triad, and they're farthest apart as you can get on the color wheel, so they have a whole lot of energy. You know, if you're trying to find a couple colors to use, like, this painter just used red, yellow, and blue because you know, that they used limited color at the time this was paint, painted. But if you want to create a lot of energy in the painting, this is Broadway Boogie Woogie by Mondrian, he picked a red, yellow, and blue. Here's a watercolor. This is just three colors, and you can see the variety of color you can get. This is, this is a painting done with those three colors. So again, it's kind of knowing how to make the most out of that mix. It can be a great exercise and actually, you know, a really wonderful way to approach a painting. Here's this painter does all her work with three colors. Isn't that amazing, the amount of color she gets out of that? <clears throat> now, one other color theory, and you're, probably your ears are glazing over, so I'll go through this a little quicker, is analogous color. Analogous colors are colors that are next to each other, right next to each other in the color wheel, like notes, do, re, mi, fa, so. And what analogous color does is it creates, again, a kind of unity and harmony in the painting. And it depends like how far you, you can see here that analogous, the whole color wheel is really analogous. So if you hit every note, you can have many, many hues in your painting, but the painting will hang together, you know, because you're, you're, you're playing all the notes. You're not jumping from one side of the color wheel to another. So you can see painters, when a painter, painting looks extremely harmonious like this Paul Clay, if you sat down and you cut up a reproduction and laid all the color out, you'd see he's got very close steps of all of these different colors. To turn a form, you're often using analogous colors. In this case, when I paint these peaches, I'm going from purple to cool red to warm red to orange to yellow. Now, if you look at, um, Harmony again, here's a painting that doesn't have enough movement. It's like, it's, it's very um, boring in a way because it's sort of all on one side of the color wheel. And here the student has put in a color, but now it's unbalanced. 
and now these analogous colors that extend the color wheel but relate help to pull it together. So that's another thing that we think about. Now I just want to talk for a minute about color as color. In different periods of art, painters have approached colors in different ways. Back at this time when Giotto was working in the 1300s, color was king. I mean, color was bright. Then we get to the Renaissance when artists are, are more interested in turning a form. They've discovered anatomy. They've discovered, again, after losing it for a thousand years, how to make a form be in the light and go around. And they get less interested in color. Now they're interested in tonal painting, mostly earth colors. And then we go back to the Impressionists, and, and this is a Cezanne, and, and with a Poussin on the other side, and we see that all of a sudden the world's become this really colorful place that it hasn't been for 500 years, okay? So we take it for granted that when the world has always looked as colorful to people, and maybe it has, but the way they interpret it has changed. It's like when you see World War II in color photos, it's very disconcerting to us, right? Because we think of it as a black and white war. So now when we look at a landscape, yeah, we can have all that color, but that wasn't true for 500 years of landscape painting. Here you can see a transitional painting that's moving into Impressionism, the generation before the Impressionists who started to go outside, but it's still like the Dutch painting was. It's still really not about color. So what made, what changed? How did Monet get there? Well, in a nutshell, a couple things. One is the scientific revolution where painters started to study optics. This is by the writer Goethe, who is interested in optics. It's technological change during the Industrial Revolution, where there started to be paint tubes and a wider range of color all of a sudden than we ever had before. And it's artists going outside and painting directly from nature, like John Constable did in England. That was revolutionary to go outside and paint. And that influenced the Impressionists. And Monet, who started to look at the world as a really, really colorful place. So now when we're looking at foliage, we're not just looking at light green and dark green and brown. We're starting to pack, like Monet did, a lot of color. And we're actually starting to see it more. This is Cezanne, who was completely observational in his painting. He did not make things up. He always had a region of observation to paint the color. And that's how he painted foliage. And here's a painting of mine where I think I'm painting what's there, but it's a lot more colorful than a Dutch painting would have been because I see the color and I have the means to express it. Color value, last thing I want to talk about is the darkness and lightness of color. And it's something I'm going to bet you hadn't thought of before, but it's there. So that pure color itself has color, has value, has dark and light. Very interesting how, again, whole periods of art see are interested in color value and then aren't and then are again. Other cultures are more interested in color value. This was a painting that was done when Europe had no interest in this kind of color. In Holland, you know, not about color. It's about value, this Rembrandt painting. Now painters we can talk in any language we want to because there isn't any academy anymore or any, um, anybody uh, kind of monitoring who can call themselves a painter or what their painting should look like. So you have painters like Wolf Kahn who are really all about color. So when you're looking at painting, it's very interesting to think about a couple of things. One is how do painters work how does their work change in their long life of painting? Matisse, at this time, was really struggling for a long time with no recognition, no money, a family. Had to go back and live in his parents' house, was painting up in the attic, and he kind of lost his interest in color <laughs> in doing that. And a lot of his earlier painting has, is more tonal like this. Later on, when he moved to the south of France, and other, you know, he, he became much more of a colorist. So, Painters change their language, you know, as they, as they go. And sometimes they're really focused on seeing the world with this kind of color. And sometimes they're focused on pushing the color so far that it starts to lose an attachment to the world and the painting becomes its own thing. Now, the very interesting thing, as I close, is that we buy this. 
right? It's like we accept this world when we see it in a painting. We accept Van Gogh's way of looking at the south of France. It's not what the south of France looks like. This is not what Cuillère looks like, where Matisse and Durand painted one summer, and Matisse almost lost his mind because he'd gone so far, literally, he'd gone so far off the color end that he didn't know if he could get back on and never sell a painting again. But we buy this because it's consistent. And that gets us right back to the first thing I was talking about, about child's work. It's that idea of being totally committed to the magic of that format, of the, the, the kind of realness of your materials. So we'll buy this pink sky. You know, if you create a whole world that's consistently that keyed up in color. And if you look at paintings, it's very interesting to like try to do some analysis, to sit there, you know, have some origami tape or whatever, and take a favorite painting and just match color and cut it up, you know, and see the see. And I bet you'll see if you get a color wheel that there are rules on that of color theory that that painting, even when it looks as intuitive as this Richard Demethorn, he's using color theory to plan that painting in ways that feel intuitive to you. And hopefully when you see the painting, it will look intuitive. But there is a whole kind of thought about how colors are relating that go into the painting in ways that you wouldn't necessarily believe just looking at the painting. So you can take that same subject. Here's some student paintings from the same photograph. And you can do different kinds of color palettes and make all different kinds of worlds. And you can also have great technique and do a really stupid painting. And that's one thing I wanted to, you know, I also want to say is this is not all about technique and training. I mean, this painter was at the top of his profession and very well trained before he was brought down by the next generation of French painters who just thought he was an idiot. <laughs> so it's a funny thing. It's like sometimes paintings can look crude and yet be very powerful, conversely, to the one I just showed you. Sometimes, here's a good exercise. Look at a painting, and let's say you look at the painting, it's like, meh. Try to think about, OK, why does this painting maybe, and I hope nobody here painted it, because I pulled it off the internet as an example of a not very good painting. Um, why does this like, ugh, and this is like, mm, you know, to me anyway. And it's got to do with the first thing I talked about, which is this painter isn't painting a barn. This painter is painting a painting. You know, it's got like it's got it's, he's setting up a whole kind of structure and world there, and doing a, a lot that isn't really clear until you start looking and you you know the language, like a child's drawing. So, just to wrap up, as I said ten minutes ago, um, <laughs> when you look at when you look at a, a, a subject like this, another interesting thing for you to do is to think about how different painters can take a, sometimes a very mundane subject and interpret it different ways, all valid, all you know, full of skill, all creating a kind of world, some you like more than others. But there are different lenses they have on. That's what I want to get through to you. Look at how a painter's work changes in the course of their life. Two Diebenkorns. This is Mark Rothko. How did he get to here? You know, whole different way he's speaking the language. Van Gogh, who has a Rothko behind him, it, it looks like. <laughs> and so, so you know, it's like the main thing in, in painting is it should move you. That's the whole point of this: is that you should feel an emotional connection. And I urge you, when you go to a museum next time, don't rent the headphones. Don't put the headphones on. Don't go with a friend so you talk. Just go and pick a painting you like and just stand in front of it. And it's going to be different for everybody in this room. Or sit down is even better. And take your time with it. It's like you're, it should be like you're listening to music. And just let the painting wash over you. you know. And, and all that, that I've talked about, that language, it's in that painting. But sometimes if you don't speak the language, then you just got to let it kind of wash over you like Italian or something beautiful. And you're going to start to see relationships, if you take the time to, that are going to make you understand why you love that painting so much. And, and, and look at things like, what's happening at the edge of that painting? You know, how are different parts of the painting talking to each other? 
what's active, what's quiet. And you know, if you sit there and, and suddenly the painting starts talking to you and you're feeling something from that conversation, then you know you're, you're looking at the painting the way the painter wanted you to see it. Take two. Who would like to ask the question? Well, we've got time for a couple of questions. Who has a question? You know everything now, right? <laughs> <laughs> did, I have a question for you. Did anything I say really surprise you about, about the way painters are thinking when they paint? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, right. And oftentimes it's a very it's a very organic thing where they'll become, for some reason, dissatisfied with what they're doing. It's a hard thing professionally to change your work mid-career, though, mm -hmm. because you you really get known for an image, you know, and it it can be difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Painters that did radically change their work, it it was sometimes a struggle professionally for them. But you know, you got to do what you got to do, also. <laughs> Oh, I, I like them. Yeah, I thought they were, I mean, sometimes those paintings are so predictable. So I liked that they were unpredictable. And um, I liked the work of those two, two painters. So, but a portrait is, um, John Singer Sargent said a portrait's a painting where something's wrong with the mouth. In other words, <laughs> you know, you just can't ever get it right in a portrait. Um, yeah, it's the one time the model pays you and you don't pay the model and it's a whole different relationship, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and both of those painters do very active patterning in their work, um, and they, they both use very strong color. So I think that was one thing that you're right. It took you off the features. And then the other way that portraits are usually painted that's more predictable is a dark background. Most of the real estate's just dark, and everything's in the face and the hand. So you're right. That was very observant of you. That's very different from most paint portraits. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, you're a writer. You're a writer. And you keep, as a writer, which is your profession you've been doing for a long time, you do, it becomes something you naturally keep in your mind. And I think it feels overwhelming kind of to when it's all laid out in a sequential way. But for when you work with something for, and all, everybody in this room has skills you've worked with your whole life that are second nature to you. And that's why it does become second nature to use this language. I mean, you speak it, you know, in a way that people speak a foreign language paint and don't have to struggle with it anymore. It doesn't mean it makes painting any easier. I mean, there's a whole other thing I could do a lecture on, which is like why painting is so hard and, and mysterious and you never really understand what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Agnes Martin, yeah, she's an interesting painter. She died, I don't know, maybe in the 80s, something. And her abstract painter, she's called a minimalist painter because when you first look at her work, it looks like, oh, well, I could do that. You know, it's like a bunch of pencil lines with some paint kind of on it. And what her work, I find it's really grown on me over time. It, kind of seeing it in the flesh is a little more powerful because it's big and you just sit in front of it and you're, you just kind of get sucked into it. So to me, it's a great example of a painting, a painting that you can be meditative in front of and not 
I think one of the real keys to looking at art and enjoying it is don't rush. Like take your time and sit and, and just let it soak in and don't try to understand necessarily. It's like a lot like listening to music. I don't know what I'm listening to with music, but I know I can listen to a Beethoven string quartet and you know just sit and it's a great way to just lie in bed and just let the, let it wash over me and I'm ignorant about what's happening structurally, but I still can appreciate it. Yeah. Well, like Paul the Whip designed the Sanford Canal for the Peace and Civil War. Mm -hmm. Well, it goes way back in art to have um, an atelier or a um, studio, like all the Renaissance painters or Rembrandt, you know, where you have um, apprentices or flunkies, as we call them. <laughs> um, now it's become extremely, among people who are, you know, in the New York and European elite as artists, visual artists, very, very often they are doing basically maquettes or sketches and having MFA students doing their work. I don't like it. I wouldn't work that way because it's to me it's the hand, you know, it's like the hand of the art. I want the for me, I want my hand in there. I would find it very unsatisfying to farm that out. Sometimes work, especially like textile or sculptural work, is extremely labor intensive. And so subcontracting that could, you know, could can make sense, I think, but um, no, I think it's kind of a, a scam when it gets to the point where, yeah. you know, yeah, I don't particularly like it. I understand it, but I don't really like it. I don't, that's not the artist I respect, you know, so much, no. Anybody else? Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was great. Thanks a lot.